Hey everybody, this is Mark Heaps for PSD Tuts, and this is another tutorial showcasing the Filter Forge plugin for Photoshop. I wanted to show you guys how I built this painterly composite uh, piece that you see on the screen right now. Um, this was actually a photo that I took during a pinup photo shoot at a local photo studio here in Austin, Texas. You can see lots of shots of this model. Her name was Emma. Really, really fun to work with. And uh, what ended up happening was I picked this shot, and you can see she was shot on a white seamless background here. And I wanted to composite her into a scene so that we could then go ahead and make that final illustrative look. So when I shoot, I do shoot raw. Um, I shoot with an icon, so you can see here it's got the NEF file extension. Let me just double click on this, and it's going to go ahead and open it in Adobe Camera Raw for me. And here you can see what that editing window looks like. So this is generally where I come in, do all of my tweaks, make all of my exposure adjustments, um, any sort of contrast or tonal balances I need to make, uh, white balance for temperature, etc. So once you're done with all this, you can actually open the file into Photoshop. But what I recommend doing is either change your preferences or hold shift, and it will allow you to open the file as an object. And this way, if you want to make any edits later that come back to the raw file, it'll bring you back to ACR just by double clicking on that smart object layer. So it works the same as if you were bringing Illustrator files into Photoshop as a smart object, but this way you're bringing in the raw camera data. So here you can see I've opened her up as a smart object inside of Photoshop. The little symbol down here on the layer thumbnail lets us know that this is a smart object, which means again, if I double clicked on this layer, it would actually open back in the Adobe Camera Raw Editor, which would allow me to make tweaks and changes to the original image file. Now the next part here, uh, obviously after I cropped her out, was I need to make a selection of her so that I can composite her onto a different background. So I'm just gonna make a selection using our uh, selection tools up here. So you can see the quick selection tool or the magic wand. And just in case you didn't ever realize, the reason they have this letter at the, size of, uh, the side of your tool strip is so that if you hold shift and press that letter, it'll actually toggle between those tools. So if I hold shift and press W, it just keeps toggling back and forth. Now, to make my selection, I'm just going to paint on the white area because it's the least complicated amount of information for Photoshop to sample from. So in respect to this, it makes a pretty easy quick selection. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and paint around here. I'm holding shift to continue adding to these areas. So anything that's white here, I'm going to try to add. Now it's done a pretty good job with that, um, but the boots got lost. So if I just hold option real quick and isolate the boots, I'm telling it to not select the boots. Now this sounds backwards because I actually do want a selection of Emma, our pinup model, but because the background was easier to select, I'm just going to start with this type of selection, and then when we're done, we're just going to inverse the selection. Straightforward, right? So, if I just hit Control shift i or Command shift i that flips my selection around, and now I have a selection of just Emma. Now, just because we have a silhouette selection of Emma doesn't really mean that she's usable or ready to be composited into anything. Um, the th next step here is we need to refine that selection because she has some hair and some fray and some little pieces of fringe on her boots and her shorts, etc. We need to go ahead and refine that. So there's two ways to do this. You could come up here and press the refine edge button and that'll bring up the dialog box for you. But what I like to do is I like to go ahead and add my layer mask first so that I can see what the actual knockout is already starting to look like. And then I just right click on my mask or control click and I say refine mask right here as an option. And then from here, I change the view mode so that it actually looks like black on white. So now I'm sort of getting a preview of what that layer mask looks like. From here, I'm just going to go ahead and use my brush and paint in where I would like it to enhance the selection. I also like to do this with Smart Radius turned on. And I'm just going to press my right bracket key to make my brush a little bit bigger, and I'm just going to paint right around the edge of her head and then let go. And see how that auto calculates the sensitivity to what's going on with the hair here? It just isolates that very nicely. So I just go around that, double check that I got all the hair. I can increase the contrast a little bit if I want that to be a little bit stronger. A little bit more over here. Grab a bit of that. Make sure none of this fray in her shorts goes missing. And around the edge of her boots down there. 
So when you're happy with that, just go ahead and press OK. And you can see for the output type, it says output to layer mask. So this is just going to update the layer mask that I have here. Other options that you have are just a new selection or a new layer entirely, new layer with layer mask. You can even have it sent straight to a new document. I'm just going to press OK. So now I've got a much better selection of her silhouette form, which makes her much more usable for compositing. Now there's still sort of this white glow that's happening around her arms here. Can you guys see that? Um, the problem with this is that I shot in a studio with a white seamless backdrop. And so what's happening is I'm getting a lot of reflection uh, from the lights and how those actually bounced back up and caught on her skin. Now you could try to spend just hours and hours and hours painting that out and blending it. A little cheater trick that I like to use is just come down to your layer styles and choose inner shadow. And this looks pretty bad, right? It looks almost like a, a bad beveled image of her. Um, but what you can do is place your cursor inside here and just move around where that shadow is. Now, I don't, I don't ever use this angle thing up here. It's just much easier for me to visualize while I'm moving it around. So if I just kind of move that in place to where I think it needs to block some of that white reflection, then I just turn up the size of the inner shadow and blend that in a little bit and then reduce the opacity. I want to reduce it until I basically see the white edging kind of drop out. I don't mind a little bit, but I just don't want a lot. Okay, so that's a pretty simple fix for getting rid of some of those white frayed uh, highlighted edges when you have a photograph like this. So when you're happy with that, the next thing is we're going to need to composite it against our background. So let's go ahead and look at that. So now I've got Emma brought over into the file that I want to composite her into. And the next step really is to decide on what I want the background to be. And this is where I introduce Filter Forge. Filter Forge is this really powerful plugin and a standalone application that allows you to do any number of things. There's over 4,000 filters available inside of this plugin. Everything from toy cameras to painterly effects to texture skins for 3D models and so much more. But what I wanted to show for this particular tutorial was how I used it to build backgrounds. So just to give you a preview of some of the ones in here, for example, there was one background that was called Dave's Siding. Um, there was another one in here that was a wooden wall. That was pretty neat. And there was even another one that was a building generator that would actually allow me to have this sort of framed out wall. And you could add windows to this, you can add doors, uh, so much that you could do to this. Now, when I'm building these little background textures, it doesn't need to be on an image file like this. So what I'm gonna do here is just open up my little gray squared file that I have, and this is the size that I'll be working to. And I'm just gonna go to Filter and come down to where it says Filter Forge and Filter Forge 3. It's really easy to install when you download from their website. Um, and what I really, really like about this particular plugin is if you are on the website, you can just go to this link right here that says filter library, download more filters. If you find a filter on the site that you like, you can actually just go ahead and choose it on the site and say launch an application and it installs right here. Now what I wanna show you guys is under the building category. Here you can see some filters that I've downloaded. Here's the Dave's siding filter that I mentioned earlier. And you can see it's a pretty realistic looking background texture. There's some nice decay on the paint. There's some good texture. The lighting and shadows have a nice strong contrast, which means there's plenty for me to pull from to composite with my photograph. And there's all kinds of presets that you can see down here. This one comes with 10 factory presets. Some of them have more decay than others. But this just gives you a lot of options as a photographer to be able to composite your studio shots with instead of me having to own just curtains and curtains and curtains galore with paintings like a theater would. So here you can see that little preview. And if you wanted to change or customize anything, under the settings button, you have the options for the color of the paint, the color of the wood, um, the amount of paint peel you've got, the number of planks that you want. You can even have variation if you want it to offset a little bit. And for those of you that are web designers out there and you want to use these backgrounds for your websites versus photography, they even have a button for a lot of the backgrounds that says seamless tiling. So it'll actually calculate a way to make it seamless and you can just repeat that as a cell on the back of, background of your web page. Now, there's all kinds of backgrounds that you can use. There's decorative tiles. I like this one because it sort of looks like a glass tile backsplash, which is really, really fun. One of the presets that I really love in here actually look kind of like subway tiles. 
And I could see me using this a lot for some photo composites just because it's a really, really popular style of interior design. So when you see that, you, you realize like, oh, I, I could do a lot with that that's sort of trending right now uh, for my photography. And again, all kinds of controls. If this is too big for the scale of my photograph, because right now that, would, that tile would actually be about the size of Emma's head, so that's not really accurate, I can go in here and just change the size pixels, let that rescale, and it'll just render for me at that smaller size. This is extremely useful. So some of the, the pieces and filters that I used for, for this particular demo uh, was more rough wood. And you're going to see this a little bit later on. Um, but I used this to make a window pane for the front of the subject. Um, and then I experimented with some other things like rough plastering, slate flooring. Uh, here's our wood texture uh, that you saw earlier. And then here's that wooden house generator that actually allowed me to um, produce that wall in the background with the framing on it. So all of these filters just have so many controls that you really, really can have limitless options for how you want to make your backgrounds dynamic. Okay, so when you're done with it, you can just hit apply. It'll go ahead and render that back to Photoshop, and then we can start building out our composite piece. So here back in my working file, again, I showed you earlier some of the backgrounds that I had applied to that gray file. Um, the one I ended up deciding on was this wooden wall. And I, I did explore some other ideas for compositing. I thought about, you know, maybe if I split the two, I could put a mask in here and have these two types of backgrounds. But in the end, I just kind of liked the wooden wall on its own. But I wanted to build some depth into this scene. So I started adding some cast shadows. You can see here, I just made a selection of her silhouette. You can do that by pressing Command or Control on PC and clicking on this layer thumbnail. And that gives me her selection again. And on a duplicate layer, I filled that with black reduce the opacity. And what I did here is I converted it to a smart object so that I could add Gaussian blur. Now the reason I do this after it's a smart object is because if I think that I blurred it too much or not enough, I can just double click right here and change the original blur settings. This is the beauty of using those smart objects is it allows you to work non-destructively and you can go back and change settings later. So if I just press OK to that, I've got this nice cast shadow back here. Um, I could have probably done this with layer styles, but I liked the idea of having it separate so I could apply my filters. And then from here, I added a series of gradients. For example, this gradient with the blend mode set to multiply, the opacity is 26%. Let me just show you what that looks like. At 100% and normal, it's just a simple selection going from black to white. Changing it to the multiply blend mode drops out all of the white values. And then reducing the opacity just allows those black values to blend right in there. So that gives me a little bit more lighting underneath this shelf. And the idea here is that when I took this photo, I had a light above and to the left of her. So I'm just trying to mimic some of that. In here, I added a secondary shadow just for a little bit more dramatic effect. And then I put this radial gradient right over the whole scene of the background to mimic that light source. So you can see that actually changes the effect quite a bit and makes it a little bit more believable as a composite. Now, one of the things that happens here is these areas of the background, because they're digitally rendered, they look really strong. There's a lot of high contrast going on in here. I could lessen the contrast, but what I think I really need is to add some contrast to Emma herself. So I did this with a levels adjustment layer. And if you ever wanna have access to those, you just come down to here where you see this half dipped cookie, choose levels, and that will bring up the Levels dialog box. Now, I've done this already, so let me just show you guys what that looks like. And what I've done in here is I've taken the low-key slider. You have two sliders in your Levels dialog box. One is called the low-key, which is this one on the left of the input levels. And then you have your high-key slider, which is the bright slider on the right of the input levels. And all I did was bring this in to where the start of the histogram shows data. So I could just bring up that contrast. Now, if you ever want to see exactly which pixels are being affected, just hold Option when you're sliding this, and you'll slowly see a little preview of which pixels are starting to turn black. That way you know exactly what's being affected. Now, to make sure that this happened only to Emma's layer, I could have put a mask on here just selecting her out, but instead I used a clipping group. So if you just hold your Alt or Option button and you place the cursor between these two layers, you can see we get this custom little symbol. 
If I click that out, now the levels are affecting the entire image. And that actually doesn't look bad, but the idea was to not increase contrast on the background. So if I just option click between these two again, now that's only affecting Emma. And I didn't need to make any selections or any masks. So the next step here after doing the levels was to try to create some depth in the composite just so uh, you get an illusion of a real room and a real scene, right? Versus a model starkly standing in front of a backdrop. So the idea here was to add this frame, like you're looking through a barn uh, and what that might look like. So what I've done here is I've added this frame with a broken window pane. Okay, and you see all the glass broken up here. And right now it's really blurry. Let me turn off this Gaussian blur smart filter that I have and you can see what it actually looks like, right? So here's that rough wood filter that I showed you earlier in Filter Forge. And what this did is it actually built a wall out of all these planks and I just masked that out and duplicated it to build my frame. And then this is actually a filter they have called, I think it's called Ice Age. And this is just applied to a composite of the scene as it is. Now I have these composed together as a smart object. Let me show you what they look like individually. So here you can see there's one wood wall that's made with the rough wood filter and filter forge. And here's the other rough wood built with filter forge. And I love the way that this looks. I can imagine doing some spray paint on here, um, some old vintage printed signs or typography. That would look really, really cool. And then down here at the bottom, let me just turn these off you can see my icy glass window. And all this is, is a composite of the scene. And then I just turned this into the Ice Age filter. And then later I masked that out. I just did that kind of abruptly with a pen tool, but it gave the effect of this broken window glass. Okay, so now you can see what that looks like. So to do this, I just took the scene as it was, and I pressed Command Shift Option E or Control Shift Alt E to get a merged version. You can see here that new layer is produced. And from here, just to save some processing, I'm going to run this through Filter Forge as its own individual file. So let me just choose Duplicate Layer, New File. So here I have just this image on its own layer in its own file. Now I can go to Filter, Filter Forge, Filter Forge 3. and choose Ice Age. And what this will do is it will give the effect that there's something trapped in this block of ice. Now with the presets that we have over here, you have some really extreme looking presets, um, but you have some that are very, very subtle. I personally kind of just liked the default one. And some of the custom settings that we have available to us are things like the frostiness, the roughness of the ice, ice thickness, the thing that I really liked down here at the bottom says air inclusions. This is sort of the degree of bubbles and pockets that you want to see in the detail of the ice itself. Now granted it's designed to look like ice, but I've taken pictures of lots of old barns and I can tell you windows as they age over 100, 150 years, the glass actually does start to look like this. So this was a really nice filter to be able to use to add to this composite effect. When you see this done, you can just go ahead and hit apply and it's going to end up back in your Photoshop file. So here you can see I've got the Ice Age filter that's been applied back to my Photoshop file, to my composite. And so to make this look like the window pane is in front of the scene, I'm just going to go ahead and turn on that rough wood that we made earlier with Filter Forge. So here's one panel that was made, and that was just made over the gray file that I talked about earlier. And I just masked that out with a selection. Just duplicate that same layer and make a vertical version. Again, same thing, just a quick little lasso down here to make a mask along this black contrast edge. And there's my frame. And then to make my window, I just went in here real quick. Now you can do this with a pen tool or a lasso tool or whatever you want. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead for this little demo, use the polygonal lasso, and I'm just gonna sort of click along some of these cracks that I see in here and some of these deformations. Okay, so there's one. Let me just double tap here to close out my selection. I'm going to grab one from the bottom here. Just sort of go along some of the detail that I see. It doesn't have to be too perfect, although you could spend a little bit of time on this if you wanted to. Just come back around the outside here. Close that off. 
And now I'm just going to go ahead and hit the layer mask button. So now I've got my little window scene and I can take this and composite it back into the original photograph that we had earlier. Now to do that, I want to be able to retain some editing back to this file. So I'm just going to go ahead and convert this to a smart object and now copy this layer back into our composite file. So here's our little window pane smart object layer that's been pasted from our other file. You can see here it's a smart object, so in case I want to edit it, I can just double click on this and go back to that source file again. And it looks pretty good as a composite now. We're starting to add some depth to our scene. We've got things in front of our subject, we've got the wall behind our subject. But again, if I was shooting with a camera and I was focusing on her, um, this window pane would not be so sharp, it would not be so detailed. So I'm just going to go ahead and blur that real quick. So I'm just going to go up here to filter, and I'm just going to use a simple Gaussian blur. I'm just going to soften that up a little bit. Not too much. That would look kind of crazy. I want to keep some of the detail in there, but not so much that it uh, that it's distracting and, and not giving the illusion of perspective. So I'm just go ahead and press OK here. And then the very last thing that I like to do, and I do this with almost all of my composites, is I add some sort of exclusion layer so that I can bring all of the tones together. So to do this here, I've just added a solid color layer. Now you do that, again, just coming down to this little half-dipped cookie and you just choose solid color. And when you do that, it's just gonna give you your color picker. You choose a color, and it adds a new layer, just like you see here. So I've got this sort of sky blue cyan layer, and I've got that set to exclusion as a blend mode, and then a very low opacity of 10%. But look at the difference here with it on and off. See how it sort of just brings all of the tones together because they're all being blended um, with one joint calculation around this color. So by choosing this color, I've said exclude these particular values, and that brings all of the other tonal ranges closer together. Now, if the opacity was too high, when you first apply this, it looks really bad. It looks just like that. That's not something that you would ever think that you can use. So sometimes it's a good reminder that when you apply an effect, turn down the opacity really low until you get something that you like. And I'm pretty happy with that. Now, let's look at how we make the illustration style that I showed you earlier. Here's an example of that. To do this, we need to go back into Filter Forge to build our texture. To do this, rather than applying uh, the Filter Forge filter for the texture that I want to the entire picture, what I'm going to do is use that gray tile again. You can see there. And then I'm going to use Filter Forge just on that gray square. And the filter that we're going to use for this, I downloaded from their site and installed it. And it's this filter here called Paint HDR Tist. Very catchy name. You can see there's a series of presets down here, and all of these are sort of in varying degrees of hue. Some are warm, some are cold, some are desaturated, um, etc. And you have lots of settings around this. Do you want um, pseudo HDR? Do you want to have the art border that you saw around the edge, which is this white sort of trim that's starting to appear here? It looks sort of smudged and painted out. You have stroke cleanup, smoothing. Uh, do you want to have edge opacity, sort of blending where the, the brush strokes are crossing each other? Uh, you can even choose colors for your art border. And if you want to get really detailed, as if you were applying this texture or this filter to a photograph, you can also use this feature called sharp painting. It's very, very slow, but allows you to retain a lot of the detail in your image. Now, I didn't want to do that because I want to retain the qualities of the photograph. So what I'm going to do is just choose this particular filter effect and apply it to that gray square. Now I'm going to press apply and open that back in Photoshop. So now our HD artist filter from Filter Forge has been applied to my gray tile. I, I like the texture. I like what's happening with the art border. It's kind of the effect that I want. So I'm just going to go back over to our composite image. I'm going to do our Command Shift Option E trick again, or Control Shift Alt E if you're on Windows. That will give me a merged version in a new layer. And I'm just going to right click on that layer and say Duplicate Layer and pick my other file. Tab over here real quick and you can see I've got my composite image as well as our HD artist texture. And with this layer above, I'm just going to change the blending mode from Normal to Overlay. And now I have a really cool composite image with this illustration style blended over the texture from Filter Forge. Hope you guys liked that effect and liked what you see. 
If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments area on this tutorial page, and I will try to answer anything you guys ask. Hope you guys are having fun with your pixels. Bye.